Hey everyone, a feature of slavery which not many people are familiar with is that children who were born into slavery were taught by their slave owners to view themselves as commodities. The historian Walter Johnson has a really good passage about this in his book Soul by Soul, which I'm going to read out. Johnson writes, quote, From an early age, slaves' bodies were shaped to their slavery. Their growth was tracked against their value, outside the market as well as inside it. They were taught to see themselves as commodities. When he was ten, Peter Bruner heard his master refuse an offer of eight hundred dollars, saying, quote, that I was just growing into money, that I would soon be worth a thousand dollars. Before he reached adulthood, John Brown had learned that the size of his feet indicated to a slaveholder that he, quote, would be strong and stout some day, but that his worn down appearance, bones sticking, quote, up almost through my skin, and hair, quote, burnt to a brown red from exposure to the sun, nevertheless made it unlikely that he would, quote, fetch a price. Likewise, by the time she was 14, Elizabeth Keckley had repeatedly been told that, even though she had grown, quote, strong and healthy, and, quote, notwithstanding that I knit socks and attended to various kinds of work, that I would never be worth my salt. Years later, the pungency of the memory of those words seemed to surprise Keckley herself. Quote, it may seem strange that I should place such emphasis upon words thoughtlessly, idly spoken, she wrote in her autobiography. Condensed in the memory of a phrase, turned about her adolescent body, Elizabeth Keckley re-encountered the commodification of her childhood. Through care and discipline, slaves' bodies were physically incorporated with their owner's standard of measure. Henry Clay Bruce nostalgically remembered his youth as an easy time when, quote, slave children had nothing to do but eat, play, and grow, and physically speaking, attain a good size and height. But Bruce also remembered the daily routine he enjoyed was chartered along a different axis by an owner interested in his growth. Quote, a tall, well-proportioned slave man or woman, in case of a sale, would always command the highest price paid. As John Brown remembered it, the daily incorporation of his youthful body with his enslavement was a matter of coercion as much as care. Brown's mistress, quote, used to call us children up to the big house every morning and give us a dose of garlic and rue to keep us wholesome, as she said, and make us grow likely for the market. Having staked a right to her slave that stretched into the fibres of their form, she would turn them out to run laps around a tree in the yard, lashing them to make them, quote, nimbler, forcibly animating their bodies with the spirit she imagined buyers would desire. Brown's memory makes another thing clear. The process by which a child was made into a slave was often quite brutal. As an adolescent, Henry was adjudged, quote, right awkward, and beaten by his mistress, who thought his arms too long and hands too aimless for work in her dining room. Ten-year-old Moses Grandy was flogged, quote, naked with a severe whip, because he, quote, could not learn his master's way of hilling corn. Thirteen-year-old Celestine was beaten until her back was marked and her clothes stained with blood because she could not find her way around the kitchen. Twelve-year-old Monday was whipped by his mistress because his lupus made his nose run on the dinner napkins. Just as the bodies of slave-holding children were bent to the carefully choreographed performances of the master class, in their table manners, posture and carriage, gender, appropriate deportment, and so on. Motion by disciplined motion, the bodies of slave children were forcibly shaped to their slavery. From an early age, enslaved children learned to view their own bodies through two different lenses, one belonging to their masters, the other belonging to themselves. As Henry Clay Bruce put it about a youthful trip to the woods, that ended in a narrow escape from a charging boar, quote, it was a close call, but we kept that little fun mum, for if Jack Perkinson had learned of his narrow escape from the loss of two or three negro boys 
were five or six hundred dollars each, he would have given us a severe whipping. Whether by care or coercion, or by their peculiar combination in the nuzzling violence that characterized slaveholding quote paternalism, enslaved children were taught to experience their bodies twice at once, to move through the world as both child and slave, person and property. If you like this video, please support me on Patreon, even if it's only $1 a month. Have a nice day everyone.